Welcome to the Bread and Cup podcast hosted by Corey and Shauna Burris. They are a former pastor, a college teacher, and Pacific Northwest coffee lovers. Mostly, they are Jesus followers who find themselves in lots of interesting conversations with non-Christians, former Christians, wondering Christians, and young adults from all kinds of backgrounds. And we want to invite you into those conversations. The Bread and Cup podcast is a place for real talk about the Bible, life, and what it takes to move beyond the easy answers. So let's grab a cup and join the conversation. Welcome to the Bread and Cup podcast. This is Corey. And I'm Shauna. Today we have blueberry and lemon scones, and we're drinking hibiscus tea delicious it is very good yeah and scones are always good so they're a household favorite for sure yes. yeah. but uh this week we are talking about the bible which yes. is the if you will the handbook of our faith right yeah. and so if if there is if there are discrepancies or if there are questions about it it's very easy to go oh well this this doesn't apply to me and you know and to throw the whole thing out and so we're going to talk about what is the bible um, and more importantly, what does what does what it actually is mean to our faith? Sure. And first, we have to acknowledge that this is something that people get PhDs about, yeah. and this is a thirty to forty minute podcast. So we are in no way going to be able to cover any of this in depth. If you're looking for a great resource to actually mine what the Bible is and you want to do that in an accessible way, um, we strongly recommend the Bible Project. You can find their stuff on, it's called the Bible Project Podcast, and you can find their things on YouTube. Um, so, And you might not even need to listen to us once you've heard them because they do it so very well. But this is the conversation we have. So to start off with, uh, did you know that the Bible was not written by an old white guy. Right. Well, and this is that, that concept yeah. that the, is the Bible, well, there, was, there were a bunch of, well, not white, but there were a bunch of men that did actually write portions of the Bible. Um, there is an argument that possibly some of the songs or Proverbs were penned by women. We, that is, that argument is done by people much wiser than I, but. Yeah. But but the idea is, is the Bible, you know, I, I think that there are kind of two ways of viewing the Bible. And I think that the modern evangelical Western point of view of the Bible is that it is this historical document that documents the entire history of the world and that God like whispered in, in some dude's ear or some woman's ear and said, say this and write this down. And that's not actually how it was written yeah and 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 that there is that while i think the big question is can the bible be infallible and what do you mean by infallible and that's the big question i mean i hear a lot of people talk about in the infallibility of the bible and they use that as an argument for the fact that the bible is um that there's this historical element to it yeah. and that it just it's just an archive of history yeah. and therefore there is nothing in it that is left to interpretation yeah. and i think that there's a difference between that and saying that the bible contains 100 percent truth yeah well and at least in this the spheres that that I've gotten to have conversations about this in it seems that the people who most vehemently hold to the idea that um the inerrancy of scripture is sort of the term yeah. they use. They often mean the inerrancy of their translation of scripture too. Right. And, and you know, I, you can't paint with broad strokes, but for this conversation, we sort of have to, because um, we can't have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every point of view of the inerrancy of scripture, but that it, it seems to me, that very often it's, but the Bible is inerrant and it says this and therefore, and they, and they take out a nugget, a sentence, or even just a concept um, from their English translation and they just copy paste it on all sorts of cultural and worldviews and, and actions um, and then sort of do that. Maybe that's where the Bible thumper thing comes from, right. that sort of idea of like, but it's inerrant. Um, and as... I think you and I very much feel, yeah, the Bible is trustworthy. However, my reading of it needs to be well informed. I don't get to just pick it up, read it, and laissez faire apply, and then get angry when someone says, that doesn't seem very Christian. 
Right. And it reminds me of, so I, I was in, in Bible college and I remember sitting in a classroom and we were talking about the story of Job. Yeah. And, um, and we start off talking about the story of Job and the professor starts talking about the fact that the story of Job is most likely a, almost like a parable, right? Like it sure, is it's not an allegory. It, for yeah. Principle. It, it mm-hmm. is, it is to help us understand what this is, that, that, who God is and, and give us a look into how God interacts with who we are as, as beings. Right. Yeah. And, and I remember him saying that, and I, we had a student cause he was 19 years old, obviously the smartest kid in the world and stood up and, this. <laughs> and stood up in the class. <laughs> We're sorry. And he said, how can you say that? Like the Bible is truth. And, and the professor was like, I'm not saying the Bible is not truth. I'm saying that you have been taught probably maybe in your in your Sunday school class that that Job was a man that walked the earth maybe he was maybe there was a man named Job but that's not what the author of this book is intending that's not what he was talking about and right. and many of the people from from throughout history all of the people up until Jesus's time did not look at the bible and go well Job when he walked the earth they thought Job's story tells us something about the character of God yeah and, and that it isn't, it, I guess the idea behind that is that it isn't less true because it isn't the way that you're familiar with. Right. And it's leaning into that tension um, and moving sort of beyond the easy answer of like, well, don't you know, this is just the way it is because we saw it on, as we say in episode zero, the flannel board of Sunday school, but really being willing to lean in and say, okay, my bias is telling me that the Bible can only be true if Job was an actual person and that right. those spiritual conversations actually happened, opposed to acknowledging that this is a specific literary device that was known and recognized by both the author and the original intended audience, and that they would have read or heard it before it was maybe unwritten. They would have heard that story. In a very specific way, just like when we listen to, um, you know, when we listen to a musical, we expect certain things to happen in the context of that, of that performance. And our expectation actually brings um, a a set of, it's not context, but our expectation, yeah, provides context for what's happening, where if that happened by itself, it would be nonsensical. Right. And I, I think that like... So, you know, what is it called? Homo, not homiletics. That's the that's hermeneutics. How, hermeneutics is about interpreting the Bible, like looking through the Bible yeah. and figuring out what. And one of the first things they ask you in hermeneutics is, "What was the author's original intent?" And um, I think in in the way that we look at the Bible, we need to look at what is the author's point behind this letter, yeah. um, behind this this verse, behind this story that we might have put in there. Right. Um, and the Bible was not intended to be the history of the, the Israelites. And I think that sometimes we And view certainly it that not way. the history of the world specifically, as if it was right. a science textbook. And this is a right. conversation um, we have also had frequently, and I, I hope she's okay with me calling her out, but especially with our teenage daughter, who is very interested in the STEM fields and has a great mind, um, especially for like the human sciences. She right. loves that stuff. And she'll come home from, you know, a biology class and well, heck not even biology class when she was in second and third grade and they were learning about the weather systems, she would come home and press me about how those, how did that have to do with God and creation and how the world functioned? And, you know, that can be a sticky conversation for for Christians who are bound in the thought process that the Bible is the Bible is so global in its approach that it is both a perfectly accurate historic history textbook as right. as what we take it to be in the western world it is off also a perfectly formed western scientific text never mind that science as we know it wasn't developed until you know about the late 1800s, right? Like the, the the scientific method and the way that we think about facts and theories and approaches, they're in the scope of the world exceptionally new. 
And yet we take that bias, we take that perspective and we sort of back imprint it on the Bible. And so, you know, with her, we get to talk about that, um, or at least I get to talk to her about it quite a bit of like, well, let's be sure that we're not trying to make the Bible something that it's never promised to be. Your expectations don't get to dictate how God talks to us. Right. And it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't um, define how, again, going back to like an original intent of, yeah. like it doesn't define what the purpose behind what was being said is there, right? Like, right. And so not only is it not a, not a holy, and I don't mean holy as in like holy, but I like, think you mean global. Not as in a global historical yeah. or scientific document, but it also it it is more than that in many ways, right? Because yeah. it gives us insight into the, the character of who God is, and we get to see. And so He's specifically answering questions for us yeah. of who He is. So it's yeah. revelatory. and who we are in relation to that, right? Like, I mean, if you flip it yeah. open, page one is. Who he is, he is a creator who makes good things, which was actually a very unique perspective. If you go back to the timeline of when Genesis was captured, right? So, you know, I, I don't want to get into a debate about when it was written and when time started, at least not today, maybe a different podcast. But if you go back to the the formation of civilization and when Genesis was accounted, Every, when it was started being passed down orally, because that's how it was right. passed along. Absolutely. That the other oral historical traditions of the neighboring nations to what would become um, the nation of Israel, they weren't yet, of course, but, but those neighboring areas, every creation story starts with destruction. It is not actually good. It is the gods or the god, depending, always, actually always gods, I think, were destructive forces that would then somehow, um, it would be great chaos that would birth humans. And humans were often, in that case, created to serve the gods' whims and needs. And you see that certainly in um, Greek and Roman mythology. You see some of that in even some of the Norse mythology, where sort of they're somewhat benevolent, but kind of they have their own issues and it right. you know collides with the earth, uh, where the biblical creation story is exceptionally unique in that the, the God is the creator who didn't create anything except for to generate good and order and then invited relationship. There's no relationship in any of the other right. period equivalent. Um, they come down every once in a while from their pedestals and they, and they muck mingle up with us. and they mess yeah. around with us and then they go back to their, yeah. Place yeah, exactly. And yeah, and that's the best you could hope for as right. far as relationship opposed to the, and so it's right on page one, this idea of this is going to be the whole point of this narrative is that there is a, a good God who creates order and beauty and, and desires things to grow, right? It's all this garden pictures and then plops humans into it and gives them special standing and a special job. Like you are here to make this garden grow beautifully. Go do that. It's good, happy work. And you can feed yourselves and you can thrive right. and flourish and all these things. And that to me is one of the things that's captivating about looking at the Bible from the Bible's perspective opposed to my, my science textbooky. I want things to be accurate, you know, very specifics bound point of view right. is that oh what what is the what is it trying to tell me let's join its point of view instead of trying to get it force it into my point of view and when people say well it's it's a narrow minded point point of view well yeah because you're taking something that is incredibly complex and beautiful and you're my, you're, you're cramming it down to be some sort of touchy feely happy good lucky like yay joy and freedom prosperity right. or some simplistic rule book of like these are the things you need to do to be yeah in and it's just good standing it's just neither of those right it's just neither of those things and i think we will talk about each of those individually 
right. as their own conversations because they very they have frequently been their own conversations. The idea of the Bible as a rule book. So we won't maybe go further into that today, right. but well, I would I do want to talk about. Um, so one of the things that I always hear. Um, from people is the translation of it into the English language. Oh yeah, and how um, if you don't read the King James, you're not really reading. Yeah, the Bible. and I remember I again going back <laughs> to Bible college. I remember having arguments with people where they were like, there was arguments about which one was the most accurate and which one was the best version to mm. use. And there's even now today, I've, I've I've heard people pull that out of like, well, you know, you read from this version. Not that I used version. to be an NIV girl, then I went ASV, and now I'm pretty much ESV. But you know, you know, but that's how you define <laughs> yourself, right? I, and so. Or as our kids used to say, they would quote Bible verses and they would say nerve at the end, not realizing that that is... NIV revised. (laughs) All bless their hearts. That was just just bad science. Yeah, we broke that down Um, fast. So, um, but... I think that uh, there there's a lot of people that say, oh, well, the Bible's not accurate because the translations weren't accurate. Yeah. I actually, I disagree with that uh, for a lot of reasons. Yep. Part of that being that like the, the Bible itself has stayed as it is for thousands of years. Sure. Old Testament is the Old Testament that was used by Jesus at that time. We know yeah. that we have documentation that proves that that happened. Then we had... You know, um, you know, the, there was d- meetings that decided on which books of the right. Bible. There's a great video and documentary, or not documentary, a discussion um, that we can link to in the notes about uh, how that Bible was formed. Like, how yep. did they choose this book over this book? And it's yep. much more simple than most people think. Some people think that it was a whole bunch of guys sitting around, around a room and saying, we don't like that one, throw it out. And well, you it know wasn't. it was all the guys. It prob- I that secretly believe the wives like, were pulling the strings behind the scene because that's sort of how I happen to believe history took place. But True. that's my feminist view. <laughs> But but there's a lot of people that think that, you know, there was this grand conspiracy of which ones we wouldn't throw in. If you watch, right. you know, History Channel documentaries, you would think the same thing. None of that being true, right? And, right? and I won't go into great detail about that. Maybe another day. Yeah. But one thing I do think is really interesting is the fact that um, uh, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in, I think, around the 20s, 30s, 40s kind of decade. I think the 30s, and, and they yeah. started rolling them out and... and there were so many of them, it took them decades to go through all sure. of these. Sure. Well, and it's, you know, archival, like you, and they keep finding history documents, yeah. right? So it's, you know, the, the material it was written on was fragile and it hadn't right. been stored properly and all. You they know, were in yes, jars. So to, and so they had to roll yeah. them out and they compared them with the current Bible that we have that we've translated from, from most of our modern uh, yeah, from translations. the old codex. And, and, and it was very, very accurate. Yeah. And I think that that to me is a testimony of, first of all, God's character. Yeah. But I also think that it, it, um, it kind of disarms the idea that the Bible is not trustworthy. Sure. And what, again, coming back to the, the modern English translation is fallible in the sense that our understanding and words that we see in the modern English language yeah. can never carry the same depth yeah. that the, the original language did yeah. in many ways. And so well, you, lo- I, you lose some of the wordplay, right? Like the, the Bible is this brilliantly written piece of literary mastery and and in the original languages there's these super fun little word plays that happen and we we lose that context when it gets translated so we we get the message of it but we miss sort of some of the things that could be a tongue-in-cheek wink at the audience of like oh you know this or the choice of a word that could have two translations where they choose the one word in a different context because it's meant to remind you of how that happens in other place and and then sort of bring some of that with it. And a great example of this is um, not from the Bible, but from our modern language is your Danish is Hygge. Hygge. Yes. Uh Yeah. And so this word has been kind of showing up now more in our conversations with people. Yeah. Because because there's like like a board game for it and that you can buy posters of it. Yeah. Like, I don't know. The Americans have decided this is the next cool thing. It's spelled H-Y with a little. No, just H-Y-G-G-E. Okay. So that's that's how it's spelled, and so we you hear it called Higa, you call, hear it called lots of different things. Yeah, Huga. Yeah, Huga is probably yeah. the closest. And and 
you you were talking with some people the other day and you yeah. were mentioning to me that they were it you can translate it to be cozy or comfortable which yeah. has an element of it yep. but but unless you're danish and you grow up using that word you can never yeah. fully encompass in the english language all that that word means when somebody right. hears it instantly Right. There isn't a single word that translates. And so right. The, you're right that the best, probably the, the closest would be cozy, right? Because that's kind of how we use it, right? Cozy right. is the idea of, you know, there's on Reddit, there's the hashtag cozy places, right? The subreddit where it's all these beautiful rooms with like big fluffy beds and Edison lights hanging and curtains and sunlight filtering in just perfectly and the ocean crashing in the background. You can practically hear it and they're so cozy. Um, and so it, it, there is a richness to that word, even in the English language, but it doesn't quite get us there. But it has to, because you can't take a paragraph in a translation to get to the single word. And so right. sometimes I think things are lost. Or one of the other things I've heard happen sometimes um, when you're listening you know, to somebody teaching a lesson or giving a sermon, where they'll take the English word and then they'll say, well, we know that, I don't know, life means this and this and this and this. And they're using like the Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary d definition and they're imprinting on the verse all of these various meanings of the English word. And that's yeah. nice and all sounds good in a lot yeah, and of ways. And sometimes it makes for a really sweet sermon where you just walk out feeling like so encouraged. Right. But that isn't actually, you can't then say that that's a biblical principle. It's a nice right. idea. And it's maybe not wrong or harmful, but it's right. certainly not a biblical principle. And so these are some of the things that certainly for people that grow up, maybe one step outside of the church, they go to church sometimes with an auntie uncle or or a neighbor or their grandma where they're hearing bits and pieces of sermons and stories and they're getting the um you know sort of the cartoon children's church version of some of the stories and then they're hearing in youth group some nice little story mostly about how you you know need to not do stuff with your boyfriend girlfriend you know that kind of thing and then that's the entire idea of how they approach the bible right and um, we love we love the show, um, The Good Place, right? Right. Hilarious. I love it. Worst theology ever. <laughs> yes, right. that is right. worst theology ever. And but the reason that that resonates with Western audiences is they actually believe that that is that that is a somewhat Christian approach to the afterlife. Right. It resonates for a reason. Um, it's true. And. And sort of that's part of these conversations we get to have is that we don't get to take our assumptions with us to the text. We have to be willing to approach the text for what it's trying to tell us. And and along that, the the text, this text in particular, the Bible, is so like we we're talking about a culture that did so much around. Uh, metaphors and and yeah. using visual Im or like trying to make yeah. you think of imagery and well they of, didn't have film majors then right and think about the so way that and the way that pictures. they yeah and the way that they communicated it originally was audibly right like the right. Bible was not put onto tablets or paper for a very very long time yeah at least and the first parts of it the New right. Testament obviously went immediately to paper but. right but um, we're talking about like old Old Testament stuff. Um, did not show up, you know, for for hundreds of years. It was passed down orally. Right. So that means that those those words also had their own kind of. Um, they needed to be that much more. I'll say dramatic. I'm not saying the Bible is being overly Im dramatic. Impactful, but, maybe. Yeah, but it needed yeah. it needed words that made people go, "Oh, I see what you mean by that." And yeah. so there there is a lot of imagery, especially in the Old Testament, where we talk about things that maybe and maybe there were historical foundations to some of the things that were sure. said, King David, and some of these things. But whether or not specific events actually happened is actually kind of inconsequential. What's important is what are the messages that. And the way that those messages were told to us yeah. to help paint a picture of who God is in our head. And I think that, that when I look at the Old Testament, I see in a, a beautiful, it actually reminds me of these beautiful paintings that we have of interpretations of biblical stories, right? Yeah. Where like they really are that 
um, rich. Yeah, rich and deep, and there's so much depth to them that is the more yeah. you read them, the more they're they're like, oh wow, I I see a beauty behind this, right? Of who the maker was, right? So. And the more you learn about it, the more you get the privilege of seeing the way that each thing connects to the other, right? The entire New Testament um, could nearly be called a commentary on the Old Testament. Like there is nothing that is happening from Matthew to Revelation that isn't right. directly influenced by what happened before. Right. And um, so that is something that I think, especially if, if you're raised in, the, um, in some of the evangelical uh, denominations, I don't want to paint too broad of a stroke because there's, there's a lot that's encompassed in that. But certainly in the churches we grew up in, there was an acknowledgement of the Old Testament stories but the New Testament was preached as, as standalone documents. Um, and I don't remember at least there being a heavy emphasis, say for maybe there's one or two of the pastors I had growing up that were really exceptional at this. Right. But most of the things, the special speakers and the camps we went to and those kinds of things largely just sort of gave us nuggets of the New Testament as if they were standalone objects. Uh, and they just simply aren't. Yeah. And you need the context of the Old Testament to understand the the messages and the stories yeah. and the letters because the letter I mean yeah because the authors and the audiences well certainly the authors and quite a lot of the audiences um knew those stories knew, knew those the, stories knew yeah they you know and in, in those cases the author would have presupposed well I'm writing to a Jewish community of Christians well, I'm not going to explain these references to Old Testament things. I'm just going to name them because for them, it would be like us making, a, well, in our peer sphere, a Tommy Boy reference. We could very quickly say, did I catch a Niner in there? And we instantly have the entire right. thing. Now, that might be, maybe we should do a Pitch Perfect reference for the younger members. I don't know. I'd... I'm not young. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I don't well, know. You all can tell us in the comments what reference we should have used, but the idea is there that there throughout the scripture there there are these little points of connection where there it's a reference that works like for us it's a half of a lyric, maybe the Eminem mom spaghetti, right? You go instantly to the song and then maybe the movie 9 mile and, and some of those things simply from that reference because you're steeped in it. Those original authors and audiences would do the same thing, but we don't have the privilege of a first century Jewish upbringing. Right. So we don't have that context, just like maybe some of well, our poor listeners doesn't. Don't and, know there, and there's also context, I mean, especially when you get into the New Testament, not just as referential stuff to the Old Testament, but there's also a lot. I mean, I love reading, I'm a nerd, but like I love reading the first few paragraphs of. Paul's letters yeah. because you get an understanding of, oh, well, who is Paul talking to? Yeah. And he always says, I'm talking to the church of, you know, you know, this church. At Laodicea yeah, or, yeah, and, and, or Galatia. And or, yeah. with this person. And then he starts yep. referencing all those people. Now, a lot of times we skip over that, but who he's referencing actually gives us some amount of context into yeah. what what he is talking about and yeah. why is he referencing those things that are going on there? Because, it tells us the assumptions that are going to be made. Yeah. And there's a lot yeah. of, I mean, this was the first church, right? Like the, these, these letters were like, Hey guys, I know you all believe this stuff over here. Yeah. And we hear that and we don't understand what that stuff is many times. Right. And then we go in and we, we read the rest of it, not just saying, well, that doesn't apply to me and realizing that the rest of that letter actually may be in reference to those things we don't understand. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that you can't read the Bible and understand it and yeah. God doesn't have a message for you, but it means that going in and again, bringing in your assumptions and your, yeah. your preconceived ideas of what the Bible should and sh should be saying to you at that time is really, really dangerous. Well, here's one of the fall downs. And I think this is maybe um, sort of a, a great place to sum up this part of this conversation. But it's one of the fall downs that we've talked about is the outcropping of the, the Luther's Reformation mm. is there was something so great about his focus on people, the people, the congregation having direct access to the word of God, right? That that shouldn't be gate kept from them. 
that in principle is beautiful. I'm so glad we have that. But some of what spun out of that was this idea that any anybody at any time can just pick it up and read it. And really, as you said before, originally, most of this was passed down in an oral tradition, which means it was being taught, right? People didn't right. just go around spouting off random scripture to each other. That oral tradition was passed down in the context of a learning environment. And then later on, as things began to be written down, there was the priests who were meant to provide education. And, and we can address the inequality of males primarily gaining that because that will come up in later conversations. But the idea was still that scripture was memorized and learned and integrated in family context and in community context and in educational context. And then finally, we see that played out in the New Testament where those letters weren't just written and they weren't emailed, they weren't FedExed, and they certainly didn't use USPS or we'd still be waiting on them to arrive, but they were sent with individuals. And those individuals were often in close, were, were in close relationship with the author. And so it wasn't just like, hey, slave, please go deliver, again, because slavery existed in that time. And I just want to be careful since I just chucked that word out there so lightly, but, but that, that was part of that culture, right? And they would have just dispatched a, a person who was at their disposal. That wasn't the way it was. They sent these letters with trusted community members, right. you know, people that were part of the faith and that there is a deep, you know, there's sort of a consensus yeah. among the scholarship that what happened then is the people who took the letter would often read the letter out to the con the congregation that was gathered and then answer questions because they would have been an integral part of having that letter created. And I think that's an important part. Like, again, this is, first of all, why we have church, right? Right. Is actually that community element of, yeah. and that structure that like, yes, it is not wrong to go home and read your Bible on your own. No, please do. And that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is when you read the Bible and then you harbor these, um, I mean, part of the reason we're doing this podcast in the first place is because when you go home, you read the Bible and you harbor this disbelief or not understanding something yeah. and you just hold on to it because you think the guy across the street or when you go back to church, if you went to your pastor or if you went to somebody else and they said, and you told them what you thought of it and it doesn't line up with them and you thought you were going to be admonished and you thought we were going to yeah. be put down for that. That's not that's not the purpose of the church, right? The right. purpose of the church is community. The purpose of the church is to come in and go, I read this. I'm really wrestling with this. Yeah. And to go, that's a really good point and have a discussion about that and to talk yeah. about what does that mean? Not one person's right and one person's wrong, yeah. but to, to have a dialogue about what that looks like. Um, yeah. It's not, nothing about the Christian faith is meant to be a passive intake. Right. And sometimes the ability, um, because we have such easy access to structured church services and frankly, podcasts and TV shows and all sorts of things that can be spiritually, you know, uplifting, uplifting or, or encouraging a, or whatever. That was a church word. That was a church word. Um, fills your soul. Um, that because we have easy access to that, it can become passive where you simply go and listen to a sermon be delivered and you're supposed to accept it fully at face value. Um, and, and really you and I believe firmly that we should do that. We go and we listen, but we bring that home into conversation always with each other, but certainly often with other people as well of what did you hear there? What didn't make sense? What did you think of the use of scripture to back up that point? Is that, was the point wrong? Was the scripture wrong? And thankfully we're in a community where very often the answer is, well, that was spot on. Um, but oftentimes it's, well, how does that apply or how does this right. work? Or why do you wrestle with that particular scripture used in that particular way? Um, what is your context you're bringing with? And having that dialogue, the Bible was not meant to be opened up and read solo any more than your 300 level calculus textbook was meant to be handed to a high school student to be cracked open and understood on their own. Learning happens in community. And I will say, this doesn't mean that you go to your pastor every single time, single time he preaches and send him like, well, you're wrong here, you're wrong here, you're yeah, wrong please here. Please don't correct them. Because Hopefully again, they have that on their own. <laughs> it's dialogue, right? Yeah. Like it's conversation of like, I'm seeking truth 
Yeah. Let's let's discover this together. Yep. That approach is very different than well, I don't like this and I don't believe this and I don't yep. and so and and I think it's a help me understand. Right. Not a journey of discovery versus a journey of doubt, so yeah. to speak. So and discovery entails doubt sometimes. Yeah. We certainly I mean, as you acknowledged on episode zero that our journey has gone through moments of like sort of just accepting it, you know, swallowing it whole with very little examination or some examination. I don't think we did none, but some examination and then reaching a point where, where we're like, oh, we, we know we don't believe these things. Does that mean we have to chuck the whole or not? And then leaning into that tension to carry on in the journey of finding really just stripping our own bias from it. Right. Stripping some of the expectations that even maybe we were taught to expect from the Bible, but stripping some of that away and learning what is an appropriate expectation to bring to this piece of literature um, with, for us at least, with the honor and respect of, I do believe there's a God. I do believe that God is invested in us. And I do believe that this piece of literature as a, a combined effort across many years and many cultures and many forms is actually an intended resource for us discovering the character and the nature of that God. So that is my, for those listening that maybe don't share that, that's the bias that I bring right. always. And that is a bias I, I cannot let go of without having lost all faith. But, but for me, in every other piece, I attempt to let go of whatever bias I'm bringing with yeah. to learn. But, it, but it's a bias that I think that if you are to have faith in something, right. you must have, right? Sure. And there, there is an element of believing in the, in the Bible and being like this, I'm going to submit, submit uh, another kind of Christian, overused Christian word, but I'm yeah. like, I'm going to submit to what the Bible says yeah. and, and what that means to my life. And I understand that I'm going to wrestle with this, yeah. but the wrestling is the journey and the journey is good. Yeah. And so. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I think that's true in so many, in so many things that you, there, there comes a point where you have to simply decide that something is trustworthy enough to move forward, right? We do that with our bank. We had to decide at some point that that particular institution was trustworthy enough for us to give it everything we have at our disposal. We'll find out someday if we were right. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. And, but, but that is an act of faith. We're trusting in something um, to be able to do that. And so for us, we have, even in the midst of the journey, even in the midst of looking at this objectively, reach the point where we do, we are willing to say, I believe enough in the trustworthiness of this to move forward with that lens when we examine it. And, um, you know, that would be the great challenge for, for people that um, do not share our worldview or our faith perspective, um, but are interested in looking at this whole discussion from maybe a slightly different point of view, that look at it from your lens, but just as you and I have chosen to look at all of this through an agnostic or atheist lens, maybe try looking at it from what if this is trustworthy? Not exactly accurate in exactly the way that I've learned to look at it, but what if it is actually trustworthy? And I've just been looking at it the wrong way. Right. Then what? And I think that that to me is the best, the best question because it is actually the ones that we forced ourselves into from both directions. What if this isn't trustworthy? Then what? Um, and coming back around. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the conversation for today about yeah. that. I really, really look, it's one of my favorites. I'm so glad we get to have it frequently. Yeah. But I, I very much look forward to um, down the road having some of those other conversations, those sort of more unique yeah. ones that like the one we call the golden tablet. So yeah, and this is, this is kind of the, the foundational, like, is yeah. the Bible infallible? Yes. But Ish. what do you mean by infallible? <laughs> yeah. Like, is your interpretation of it infallible? No. No. 
and that's okay too. It's, yeah. it's again, it's a journey. That's you know, we're taking it together. Yeah, so. we are. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like to join in on the conversation, check us out at, at Bread and Cup Podcast on Facebook or on Instagram. Or if you have suggestions, you have ideas or things you'd like to hear in future topics, you can also check us out at breadandcuppodcast.com. To join the conversation, like and subscribe, then find us on Instagram at Bread and Cup Podcast. You can also find us at our website and other social platforms linked in the show notes. Thank you.